Good morning and welcome to our worship from Morningside United Parish Church here in Edinburgh. In our theme today, we're looking at the gospel reading of the pearl at great price. We're thinking of what it is to find contentment, to find peace of mind, to have an understanding of what really matters. As times change and people are facing the prospect of furlough ending, when economic realities are hitting home, and when there's a sense of a second spike, people wondering and worrying developing anxiety for the future, we're going to look at what the scripture tells us is important in finding the contentment that allows us to live functionally and well. So let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for all that you've done for us, for this life, for the love that you bestow upon us. So this morning, as we gather to worship, to discover peace and your contentment, allow our hearts to praise you as we remind ourselves of the blessings that are freely given. Bless us as we worship you, for we could not know you, for no human wisdom can ever discover you, no argument can lead to you, nor any enterprise reveal you. You came to search for us in the frailty of human life. You trusted yourself so that the fragile faith of wavering disciples like us might know a different purpose and find new hope and courage. We come to you because you can turn our stumbling blocks to faith into stepping stones of hope. And in the foolishness of the cross, you can draw us to the truth that gives us meaning. So be near to each and every one of us now at this moment so that we might open ourselves to your gracious presence as flowers open to the warmth of the summer sun. Breathe your spirit upon us so that we can be conscious of your being. But we're also today remembering that our lives can be littered with hurts and mistakes. So in the spirit of love and gentleness, give us the light of your grace as we say sorry for all those things we get wrong, certain that you understand when we hurt other people by our selfishness, our unkindness, or when we neglect to practice what we know to be good and true. We remember in peace and quiet the hurtful things we've said to others, the hurtful things we've done to others and to ourselves. We remember this past week and we look forward to the future, knowing that as we say sorry, you enlighten our minds, you touch us with grace and mercy, and you forgive our sins. We ask all of us this in your name. Amen. The reading is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 14, verses 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure which a man found buried in a field. He buried it again, and in joy went and sold everything he had, and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A merchant looking out for fine pearls found one of very special value, So he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Here ends the reading. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Hear these words from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he finds one of great value, he goes away and sells everything he had, and he buys it. Contentment is a strange and elusive quality for people. We seek after happiness, good times. We want to experience our families and friends flourishing. We sometimes seek for fulfillment in strange places. But there's a disease that many people have. Men who can walk into a garage and look at a car which is less than a year old and think to themselves, we need to trade in what I have for a new one. People who can walk into clothes shops and decide, we're going to have something new. I need a new wardrobe after COVID. Think of your own homes. How many of us have too many shoes and too many clothes, and yet we're often saying we have nothing to wear. Or there's that kind of disease when we look into a mirror and never see and wonder how we ended up with our, our mother's thighs or our father's nose. We wonder why we're looking like the people who've gone before. We feel discontented with who we are. We visit new homes. We see what friends have. And sometimes we feel envious and think our own lives shabby, somewhat difficult. And then we look at our careers. We wonder we could be doing better. Or we look at our spouses, our partners, and we sometimes might think to ourselves, could we have done better? In other words, this kind of disease is hugely human. It's that idea that we cannot be content with what we have. And so we turn to our scriptures, wondering what the gospel says about finding the elusive peace of mind where meaning and substance is brought to our lives and relationships. In our readings this morning, we hear two main parables. The parable of the hidden treasure in verse 44, where Jesus depicts the value of the kingdom of God to one who accidentally finds it. But notice also, Jesus immediately follows that parable with another short parable called the parable of the pearl of great price. In many ways, this is similar to what has gone before, but there is a difference. Here, the merchant is seeking something beautiful, and he finds one. He's undeterred by its price. He sells all he has to buy it. And notice in verse 45, the use of the word again, tying the preceding parable to the story of the pearl of great price. In other words, the merchant is on a mission to find the thing that will actually make him happy. And he believes there's something out there worth looking for. And when he finds it, he recognizes its value and is willing to sell all to obtain it. Now, if we think of this parable and apply it to our lives, there are many people who know that there's something, some purpose, some meaning out there, and they seek to find it in different ways. For some, it might be that we stumble across blessings that bring peace and contentment. But for others, decisions and choices are made in an endless search because the grass seems to be always greener on the other side because people neither see nor appreciate what they actually have in their lives. In this parable, the merchant had it all, but it wasn't enough. People can crave success, riches and fortune. People might find themselves discovering that in their lives they want something else other than what they have, not because their lives are bad, because they are unable to find that sense, that great gift from God, contentment itself. We don't know if the merchant described in this parable was happy once he bought his pearl. But we can consider the words of Jesus and wonder what he's trying to show us. The fact is, Jesus uses the pearl as an illustration for the kingdom of God. And it might be lost on us in this year, 2020. But to those who were listening when this story was first told, pearls were valued for their worth, for their aesthetic qualities, for their beauty, and because of that, many who bought them just did so as an investment. They were seeing something that had to be admired and held. But Jesus was challenging them. And what are we challenged with in this particular story? How should a Christian, someone who seeks to believe and follow Jesus, react in the search for fulfillment? Well, St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians give us a crew. In Philippians 4.11 we read, I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Think of these words. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Have we learned to be content? 
Think of the person who wrote this particular test. This wasn't some young buck stepping into a new career with a six-figure income. This wasn't a man who's worked all his life to accumulate wealth and is now sitting back enjoying luxury beyond measure. This was written by a 60-plus-year-old Jew chained to a Roman guard under house arrest, not knowing if he was going to be killed or being brought to court to be set free. Though he's without the comforts of home, the privileges of privacy, he's able to say he's happy. He doesn't know what his future is. He's content. I have learned to be content, St Paul writes. I've learned to be content. So how do we find contentment? Well, the first thing I would want to say for all of us is that contentment is learned. I want you to know that contentment has to be learned because it doesn't come naturally. It's learned because Paul had to discover it through the teachings and experience of life. We're often prepared to compare ourselves with others, to want more than what we have, to interpret someone else's good fortune as coming at our expense, to complain you don't have to teach any of these things because they ought to come naturally to us. Our contentment is often robbed just by the experiences of everyday living. Online catalogues, the ability to shop to get back to what was normal life, the idea of the internet alluring us to particular purposes, to spend and to find satisfaction. But I wonder if you were like many in lockdown and there was something joyful about hearing the birds sing, about actually walking the streets without traffic of actually spending time with your families and loved ones. Contentment is something which is elusive. If you want to find it, it might not be on Amazon and eBay. We find contentment if we find perspective and attitude. St Paul greatly appreciated the encouraging generosity involved in these kind of circumstances. He'd learned to be content with what was provided, irrespective of his circumstances. And so it's significant that this apostle had to learn that virtue and adopt that attitude because it isn't natural to us. Henry Kissinger, the former US Secretary of State wrote, most people find tragedy wanting something very badly and not getting it. But many people have had to learn that perhaps the worst form of tragedy is wanting something badly, getting it and finding it empty. This seasoned politician is speaking of a different kind of truth, recognising that sometimes it's in the simple pleasures that we find the things that actually matter. Last weekend, I spent a few days away, and whilst I was away, I was able to sit by the sea and just watch the contentment of people looking out at fishing boats, wondering what was happening, inspecting sunrises and sunsets. There were people who were not out fishing, people just at the shore wondering about life and wondering what was going on. The thing that struck me was not a search for fame or fortune, but the idea that people can take time to think with what they have, to look placidly at what goes in front of us and to discover peace. For me, peace was found at Findhorn Beach. You too will have your places of wonder, whether it's at Portobello, or some exotic place in Spain or Greece or Portugal. The Austrian psycho psychiatrist and philosopher Viktor Frankl was imprisoned in Auschwitz, stripped of his identity as a medical doctor and forced to work as a common labourer. He lost his wife, brother, father and mother in the concentration camps. All his notes, which represented his life's work, were destroyed. Yet Frankl emerged from Auschwitz believing, and I quote, that everything can be taken from a man, but one thing cannot be taken. The last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any circumstances. We might not be able to choose our circumstances, but if we're seeking after contentment, perhaps we can choose our attitude. The Apostle Paul gives us a clue when he says, I've learned in whatever state I am simply to be content. And perhaps the best way to do this is to discover our priorities. It seems to me that every generation raises the contentment bar. With every new technological advance, we need to want more, to see things, to be satisfied. Things that the last generation knew nothing of, families experiencing different things. 
For those of you who are older enough, but not that much older than 50, life without coloured televisions. Think about life without mobile phones. Or think about those people who never knew what the internet might mean for them. Think about students at school who wrote things by longhand rather than to a laptop or a computer. Think about how change has happened. But contentment is not found in change. Contentment surely must look beyond creature comforts or techno toys or wealth or amusement. Surely it's accepting our circumstances as we find them and looking for this attitude of perspective, seeing what actually matters. The 19th century author Maltby Babcock said this, Contentment is about being grateful, faithful and fruitful, using what we have, little or much. Paul learned the secret. He learned to be content was to trust in God, in our Lord alone. We need to discover to ourselves what makes us happy. We need to ask the question on a scale of 1 to 10, how content are we? How does our world promote satisfaction or dissatisfaction? How do we find perspective? And for me as a minister, surely I've learnt this lesson. When I see simple courage, self-sacrifice, the care of people who can just rest upon the shoulders of others whose burdens are shared and carried. When I see the old who speak with wisdom and can turn and offer a subsequent generation a different perspective. When I see people exercising forgiveness and mercy and love itself, then we can discover an attitude which allows us to be content because it gives us the perspective of struggle, the perspective of love, the perspective of forgiveness. And finally, perhaps this in this great story of the parable of the Pearl of Great Price. We discover we have to trust in God. God's grace sustains us no matter where we are. He leads us no matter what we lack to the places where we ought to be. We can be content, whether full or hungry, whether living in plenty or want if we simply trust in God himself. The contentment of this place and of this world is that whether we're in times of conflict and defeat, in amongst change, in amongst the destructive forces of the virus, the effect of the economic burdens that many are bearing, if we trust in God and allow him to carry our burdens, we'll find a grace where he bears it for us. St Paul was content because he could see life from God's point of view, he focused on what really mattered. Paul had his priorities straight. He followed God's leading. He knew what that would mean for him. He detached himself from the things that really didn't matter to the essential things that were important itself. How can we do that? Well, can I simply suggest this? If we want to discover the pearl of great price, then draw on Christ's power for strength. If we have great needs or are discontented, then turn to him who offers a different kind of promise. If we're seeking better possessions and are longing to fill an empty place, if we want more in life, look to the way that God guides us. We'll find true contentment if we change our perspective, rethink our priorities and source a different power. The pearl of great price is available for all of us. It's about encountering the things that matter. It's about loving differently and serving fully. Do you know it's interesting, when you attend the deaths of people, the difficult times in hospital, I often find in those who are leaving this world to go to the next, conversations that are never focused on what they have, but a recognition of the love that they've received and the people that they're leaving behind. It's not of this world that people consider worth and value. The pearl of great price is remembering each day to count blessings, to see love, to never take for granted, to serve others who have little, and simply trust in the God who never fails us. Amen. Loving God, we make our prayers to you for the world, for ourselves and for other people. Heavenly Father, in this changing and difficult world where millions are being affected by the virus, where economic realities are hitting home, and where people are just struggling to find purpose and peace, Hear us as we remember all who are victims of our own human humanity. We pray for the poor and the hungry. We consider those who are seeking after justice, people who are in need, the homeless and the jobless, 
those who are frightened for their future. And loving God, we commend to your love those who are hard pressed by the unfairness and hurt in a world which leaves little room for love. We remember the hungry, the refugee, victims of violence both domestically and at a geopolitical level. Might our prayers be heard so that the people can discover your peace and the reassurance of your love. And loving God, we pray this morning for our children and for students and teachers as the summer holidays commence for so many. Bless them with our hopes, keep them safe and grant us the courage as adults to love them with the boundaries, to encourage dreams, to teach right and wrong, so that they might be blessed with secure homes, giving them in the days ahead rest and the challenge and growth of a fulfilling life. And loving God, this morning we commend to you those who celebrate new beginnings in life, those who've committed to themselves in marriage and love, those who find themselves discovering new homes, new jobs, new careers, those who are celebrating the birth of new babies. Bring your peace and strength to those who are facing change and grant them the sense to rest upon you. And loving God, we pray for all those who are affected by the COVID-19 virus. We pray for the NHS and his workers. We remember those who are working in care homes and in the community. Care for our sick. Look after the lonely and the friendless, the weak and the depressed. All those people known to us in this congregation or at our homes. We think especially of those with terminal illnesses, praying that you give them peace and your friendship. And loving God, as we struggle to make sense of our lives and the lives of our families, we thank you for all that they mean to us. Enter every home and bring peace where there's discord, joy where sadness reigns, and hope where people struggle to make sense of their lives. In a few moments' silence, we remember our families and order or offer their burdens to you, our Father in heaven. Loving God, bless the homes of those whom we love. And finally, Heavenly Father, we remember those who are mourning, people who are bereaved at this time. We pray for Jane Borthwick, whose funeral will take place this week. We remember the families of those who are struggling to make sense of life because of the loss of a loved one. Wipe away their tears, give them a sense of your peace, and reassure us that by faith those whom we've loved and lost are with you in heaven until we meet again. Amen.
So bow your head for God's blessing. Go from this place to discover the contentment of the peace of Christ. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and remain with you and all whom you love now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.